she's missing. Um, her name is Lisa Irwin. I went around the house and we're screaming for her. I said, call 911, call 911. Obviously, they are our main focus. I'm not calling them suspects. What's going on? Where's she at? Why is she gone? Now they're looking for a body and not a baby. We all want the safe return of baby Lisa. We just, we need her home. A baby would vanish from her room in the middle of the night. And to this day, nobody knows where she is. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of baby Lisa Irwin. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Lisa Renee Irwin was born on November 11th, 2010 in Kansas City, Missouri. Her parents are Jeremy Irwin and Deborah Bradley. Lisa was the youngest of three. She also had two brothers, a five-year-old brother and an eight-year-old brother. At the time of this story, Lisa is just a 10-month-old baby. Her family members would describe her as just the happiest baby you'd ever see. She always seemed to be smiling and always giggling. She just seemed to be a really happy baby. But unfortunately, that's really all she ever got to do. On October 4th, 2011, Jeremy Irwin would return home because he had just gotten off of work. And this is now about four o'clock in the morning. When he gets home, he notices that all the lights in the house are on. The door to the house is just open. And there seems to be like a window open as well, partially. So Jeremy kind of just walks into the house because this is very odd. This is not usual for, for the house. He walks down the hallway. He peeks in and sees his wife is asleep in their bed. And then he checks on the boys and they're asleep in their bed. And then he goes into baby Lisa's room. And, and that's when the nightmare begins. Lisa's crib was propped against the wall like it always was. And when he peered inside the crib, his heart sank. His stomach dropped. Lisa was not in the crib. He panics, kind of runs to the room with it where his wife is. The baby's not in, in there with her. The baby's not anywhere in the house. And so he, he just quickly wakes Deborah up and says, where's Lisa? Baby Lisa is missing. The two of them do one like quick panic look around the house. They cannot find her. She's not anywhere like in the backyard or anywhere outside the house. So they immediately call police, report their child as missing. When police arrive, they do their cursory checks around the house and, you know, they ask, you know, why is the window partially opened in her nursery? And they tell police, you know, the door was open when Jeremy got home. The two boys were asleep. They didn't see anything or hear anything either. Baby Lisa apparently never screamed or cried when, whenever, whatever happened, happened. The last person to truly see Lisa was Deborah, her mom. Um, and so initially she tells police that she put baby Lisa to sleep sometime around 6.30 to 6.45 or so that night. And then uh, she checked in on Lisa around 10.40 PM that same night and she was still in her crib. And then she said a little bit later, she went to bed, everything was normal. Something else Jeremy would tell police that was kind of odd is that the family had three cell phones total in the house and some of them were supposed to be charged uh, in the kitchen area. But when he got home and when he noticed that the baby was missing, their cell phones were also missing. They were stolen and police have no choice but to believe that the phones were taken by whoever took Lisa because at this point they're convinced someone took Lisa. This is kind of around the time as well when Deborah's story began to have some cracks. Because Deborah had initially told police the last time she saw baby Lisa was at 10.40 p.m. Well, that turned out not to be true. You see, it was revealed that Deborah was actually out drinking with a friend that evening. I think just outside the house or somewhere like right by the house. And Deborah got relatively intoxicated. And so she would eventually tell police that she actually did not see baby Lisa at 10.40 p.m. That the last time she did actually see her was when she put her to bed at 6.40 that same night. So from 6.40 p.m. and beyond, no one had checked in on Lisa at all. Police gave Deborah a lie detector test. And there's some kind of contradicting reports on this aspect, but 
Either way, police either told Debra that the lie detector test said that she had failed that test and that they had showed her that she failed. But there's also Deborah's side of the story that says that police just told her she failed the test, but never actually showed the results to her. This is not something that is entirely uncommon because that could have just been a tactic by police just to see if she would say something or react to them telling her that they caught her lying. When in fact, if she wasn't shown that proof, for all, they, for all we know, she could have been, she could have passed the test and they're just trying to, you know, goad her into saying something. In terms of investigating Jeremy, they did not give him a lie detector test. And as a matter of fact, I believe they were able to prove that he was at work and that he, in fact, did get off around four o'clock in the morning. So he was not at the house during the time frame when Lisa would have gone missing. Is it somewhat kind of possible maybe that she could have gone missing after Jeremy got home and they just sort of kind of concocted the story? Sure, but they never had any proof of that. And it just seemed a little, given the time frame of when they called police and when he got off of work, it just didn't seem like that was actually at all feasible, that he was involved in, in actually doing something with his daughter after he got off of work. Deborah and Jeremy reportedly had a good relationship. Uh, from what I can tell, there wasn't any like rifts in their relationship, nothing out of the ordinary at least. So like, you know, if Deborah did something to Lisa, that wouldn't have necessarily been a motive. Like, ah, uh, maybe he's leaving me, so I'm gonna do something to Lisa. Like, you think of all these possibilities, but I mean, ultimately, and police did too, and ultimately, They've never found any actual proof that Deborah had any involvement in Lisa's disappearance. They have nothing other than she did lie about when the last time was that she saw her. Why did she lie? I think she said it's because she was afraid that she would have been accused of something because they would find out that she was actually drunk. Uh, you know, not directly in the house. And so maybe someone broke into the house when she was out, you know, outside the house drunk. You know, people will, will do and say things just because they they feel they're going to be back into a corner. Or they feel they're going to be told that they are lying or they're told that they did something when they didn't. So people will sometimes make up information. But that at the same time, her making that information up is a severe hindrance to this case because you know that's a whole new window of time now that you have to look for things so police released this information the media became involved very quickly and they're putting lisa's image out there they're putting the story out there you know if anyone had seen anything so a couple of witnesses came forward to state that sometime around i think it was around midnight a little after midnight witnesses claimed they saw a man just a man they couldn't really describe carrying what they thought looked like a baby that was just in a diaper, which would have fit what Lisa was wearing, just a diaper in her crib. The man was seen not too far from the house. So basically walking away from the direction of that house. Police would find some CCTV footage that found what looked like a male walking through that neighborhood, but they could not tell if that individual had a baby or anything in their arms at all. But it did line up with what people claim they think they saw. But police would discover who that man was. They actually found out who the guy was walking through the neighborhood. And it was a man named John Jersey Tanko. John Tanko had a criminal history. Uh, he had an actual history of breaking into homes in this area never have been accused of kidnapping or anything like that, but just stealing items. And they apparently looked into him and his whereabouts. And, you know, I don't know if they conducted any searches of like his properties or anything. They said that they have cleared him as a suspect. That does not mean that they have ruled him out completely. It just means that as of right now, they had to clear him because there was nothing at the time they could say he did anything. On October 19th, 2011, police would go back into the home and do a, a more deeper search of the house. And they brought in cadaver dogs. And this is another area where it gets very iffy on what is exactly the truth. So they brought the cadaver dog through the house and it didn't pick up on anything until the cadaver dog got close to uh, Deborah and Jeremy's bedroom, specifically their bed. The dog reportedly 
uh, indicated there was the smell or the scent of decay or a dead body by their bed. However, I guess there would be some like attorneys that were working with the family who kind of got involved and eventually the, the hit that the dog got next to the bed was pretty much ruled out as actual human remains that the dog had either not indicated human remains in actuality or that the dog just simply was wrong uh, because they found no proof or evidence that there was a any indication that a body was ever present in that bedroom or by their bed. It's known that police had also gone into their backyard and they did a very extensive search. They took shovels and everything and they dug up the earth and they were seen coming out of the house with bags full of stuff. Um, someone said they took like a comforter, they took um, a couple t-shirts that belonged to the baby or onesies. And with the idea of testing all of these things for any possible evidence, but it's 2023 now and none of that had yielded anything that they've ever said or revealed. So police also did, with the help of some volunteers, they did a very thorough search of the wooded area. They brought the cadaver dogs in again, and the dogs never picked up on any sense, and the volunteers and the police and the FBI as well at this point, no one found anything. No traces of Lisa, no clothing items, no like pacifiers or diapers or anything like that was ever found out there. Of course, the very morning that she was reported missing, there was an Amber Alert put out to the public. That Amber Alert is still in effect to this day because she's never been found. A few days into the investigation, the police would say kind of out loud that the parents were no longer cooperating with police. And a lot of this may have to do with the fact that police reportedly told Deborah, they said to her, you did it, we know you did it, but we can't prove it. What they're using to assess her guilt, I don't know. Perhaps just the fact that she was the last one to see her. I do know they also have interviewed the two boys, but they really didn't provide any information. Um, there was a point where they weren't gonna let the boys talk to police, but I believe at some point they actually kind of had to talk to them. Nothing came from it anyway. Jeremy and Deborah would go on the news and for a while there, Jeremy was doing most of the talking. Deborah was kind of staying silent and she was seen crying on virtually every newscast. Um, they would eventually go on more nationwide things like Good Morning America and stuff like that. At that point, Deborah becomes more open. She starts talking. She she tells the news and the media that, you know, she, yes, she did lie about the last time she saw baby Lisa about the whole discrepancy of the 640 to 1040 thing. You know, I, again, she's kind of saying like, you know, I was basically afraid, I was ashamed, I was drunk, I wasn't directly in the house. And so, you know, there's there's like that point where like as a parent, I'm sure she's blaming herself for Lisa going missing, but it does not mean that she had anything to do with it, just that she may have made some mistakes that you know, may have led to Lisa being uh, taken because no one was directly in the house. Or if she was taken when Deborah was in the house, she may feel a little guilty because she was probably passed out, intoxicated in her room. So Jeremy and Deborah, they were kind of just basically fed up with police for basically just kind of accusing Deborah, 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 and not really branching out much, which I guess like, I, you know, I understand. But at the same time, you have to understand that as the last person to see her, you are going to be a suspect. You're going to be the first suspect. And usually the person who, who does something to the child is someone that child knows and is very close to. So a parent is going to be a suspect. And that that may be a status for a, for a while until they have more information. Uh, Deborah and Jeremy did end up hiring a private investigator to look into this. And they have been at that point very cooperative with answering questions, with giving them whatever they need. They've even offered a $100,000 reward for any information that leads to finding Lisa. Something to note, like with the private investigator, is that in the house, there was no traces of any kind of blood. There was no sign of any kind of struggle, even though there wouldn't be a struggle with the baby, but nothing else was rummaged through or taken other than the baby and the three cell phones. But yeah, no blood, no uh, fingerprints were found, no shoe impressions or 
or anything of that nature. Uh, police did try to recreate a break-in coming through the window of, of, of Lisa's room. And I guess at one point they got stuck in the window, like a bunch of numbskulls. So they don't even know if the perpetrator necessarily entered through the window. The door was open as well. So they kind of came to the conclusion that whoever did this just simply walked into the house through the front door because it was unlocked. And then just walked into the kitchen, stole the cell phones, then walked into the nursery and, and kidnapped the baby. But it kind of begs the question as to why. Typically, someone doing a breaking and entering into a home is really just there to steal valuables, not steal a person. Stealing and kidnapping a child is a whole different thing. That's something you're doing with intent. Like you're going into the house to kidnap the child. So police a little bit down the road, kind of after, you know, accusing Deborah and all that, after that kind of began to subside a little bit, they did also begin to look at it from the perspective of a, this was a stranger who did this. But then they had to go, why? Again, like why would you steal cell phones and then also kidnap a baby? Those two things don't really go together normally. It's very strange. So could it have been a stranger? Because it's almost as if they knew where to go to get the baby. They just kind of walked into the house, took the cell phones, and then continued going into the baby's room and kidnapped the baby. Like, it just, it, I don't know. It just seems so odd to me that those two things go together. So that's why I'm thinking this person came in there with the intent to kidnap the baby and then probably just took the cell phones for whatever unknown reason. If they've looked into close friends and family, I'm not 100% sure. I want to say they have, because you kind of have to. Then it gets stranger. In May of 2012, Jeremy noticed something about his personal bank account. There was a single charge uh, of $69.04. Where'd the charge come from? Well, that charge came from a website from the UK. And what they do at this particular website is they issue birth certificates and change names. And the police, the FBI, and even the media all confirmed this is a very real website. It does exist and they do what it claims they do. So this was several months after baby Lisa was taken and someone just so happens to use Jeremy's bank account to pay for a name change slash birth certificate. And by the way, this site is legal. It's a, it's a totally legit site. The Kansas City Police said they're, they've looked into it or they're currently looking into it, but nothing ever came from it as far as I can tell. I can't see anywhere where he reported his card had been stolen. So I'm not sure if they took if they somehow got his card information to use or how it came to be. But they did confirm that it was his card that was used to pay for this name change, this legal name change. And police have said they've looked into this, but I don't, I don't know if they've confirmed or looked into what the name was or what the birth certificate was. They haven't said anything and that's super weird. And what about the cell phones? Well, something unusual with that too. On the night that baby Lisa was kidnapped from her room, one of those three cell phones was used to make a 50 second phone call. Jeremy and Deborah said it was not them who placed the call. Who did the call go to? Well, they found that out as well. The call went to a woman named Megan Wright. Who is Megan Wright? Well, here's something interesting. Who did Megan Wright know on a personal level? Who did Megan Wright used to date? A man named John Tanko, the man that police had earlier cleared as a suspect, a man that people claimed was maybe walking around the neighborhood carrying a baby. So how on earth does he have no involvement, but somehow his ex-girlfriend or whatever received a phone call from one of the stolen phones from the house? How does that happen? Was there any connection to Jeremy and Deborah to this Megan Wright individual? No, they didn't know each other. It's incredibly strange. I don't think there could have been two different break-ins. Could there have been? Like maybe John Tanko broke into the house, stole the cell phones, and then just so happens that exact same night someone else breaks in and kidnaps a baby. 
Is it possible? Maybe. Did they find the cell phones in John's possession? I don't know. They haven't said. I imagine at this point they would have released that, like, we found the cell phones, but they haven't said if they found them or not. And they've cleared them, so they... I guess they don't think it was him anyway. Police did interview Megan, and she says she never answered a phone call, even though the call was answered, and it went on for 50 seconds. <laughs> What's going on here? This is so weird. And then the case just kind of went cold. And then 2013 came around, and... There was apparently a young girl in Greece, all the way around the world, um, that someone claimed was Lisa Irwin. This girl's name was Maria. Maria looked nothing like baby Lisa. And also, uh, this Maria individual was six years old in 2013. Uh, if it was Lisa, she would have only been about two or three years old. They did a DNA test anyway was not her. More false hope. As of right now, in 2023, there has been no updates on baby Lisa Irwin. There is no evidence pointing to anyone's guilt. If you are someone who wants to believe that Deborah had involvement in her daughter's disappearance, you gotta have evidence of it, and there is none. If this was a stranger who broke into the house and kidnapped baby Lisa, who was that stranger and why? It had to be someone who knew they had a baby. At the very least, they've gotten no leads from people close to this family. And then, you know, could it have been the same person who stole the cell phones? And I go back to the question of what on earth, why? Why, why, why cell phone and then why a baby? It's just so, it's so random to me. And then what about that birth certificate thing? That's crazy. But what have police found out about it? Uh, who knows? <laughs> that being said, the birth certificate thing does give some tiny amount of hope that maybe baby Lisa is still alive because maybe someone kidnapped her and changed her name and moved her across the world. It is very possible. It has happened. Uh, this could very well be some sort of child trafficking thing. It, it, unfortunately, it's terrifying, but it happens. As of the time of this video in 2023, Lisa Irwin would be 12 years old. There are some age progression photos on what she may look like today. There is a chance, there is a possibility that Lisa Irwin is still alive and that she is still out there somewhere in the world. If you recognize any of these images, if you know a young girl who looks like this, you need to go forward to the authorities. Again, there is a $100,000 reward for any information that leads to discovering where Lisa is or what happened to her. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Lisa Irwin, please call 816-234-5136. You can also email missingperson at kcpd.org. Someone somewhere out there knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is you and perhaps you can help reunite Lisa Irwin with her family. Or if the worst happened, you can at the very least give her family some closure and the answers they deserve. They just want to know what happened to their baby girl. And if the worst happened, at the very least, this family deserves to lay her to rest. But that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, my name is Mike, and I tell true crime stories on here, obviously. I tell four of them a week over on YouTube. This place, yeah. I also tell one on Instagram on Thursdays, one on Facebook on Fridays, and then I throw in a couple throughout the week over on TikTok. So please subscribe to me here, give this video a like so that it gets pushed out to the YouTube universe, and follow me on all my other socials if you so choose. All of the links are in the link tree in the description of this video below. If you have a case you would like me to cover, please email me, but go to my case list first, which is also in my link tree, scroll through that massive list, it's alphabetical for the most part, if you find the name on there, don't email it to me. Uh, it's already on there. I will cover it eventually. I just don't know when, but it will happen. 
If you don't see the name you want me to talk about, then email me just the name, where it happened, and when it happened, and I will add it to my list so I can eventually cover it. Next, if you would like to support me in any way, we do sell merch like this. We sell shirts that say, what does this say? Crimer or crew member. Uh, if you want to be part of the Crimer crew. Uh, we did revamp a lot of the looks and everything, so there's some new merch, including like a new Cuckoo Cachoo Wackadoo shirt. We do ship internationally. Adam does it all. My friend Adam, he makes it, he ships it, and he will ship to you anywhere in the world. Um, so yeah, that's there in the link tree below. If you use Discord and you want to join my server, you can do so. Uh, it's also in the link tree below, but you please be over the age of 18 or else you will be kicked out just because we require 18 and up in there. It's a very quiet, very chill Discord, just a fun little place to talk and hang out. Um, so we are more than happy to have you on board if you like. All right, let's end this video with a chuckle. Let's do another round of the game Live, Laugh, Lose. Not a sponsor, don't worry, they're not paying me to say this. So this is a game where you have to choose. Basically, there's a joke card that has like a dad joke on it. And then there's a card where it makes you do um, an impression as well. So you have to do the joke with this impression. Jesus Christ. I have to read this joke in an Australian accent. I do apologize to all of the future Australians who unsubscribe after I deeply offend you right now. Okay, I'm so sorry. Hello. Nope, that's, that's, that's terrible. G'day, wait. G'day, mate. Yeah, sure. Hey, what washes up on tiny beaches, mate? What washes up on tiny beaches? Microwaves. That got British at the end. Microwave. Micro. Mi microwave. <sighs> Good day, mate. What washes up on tiny beaches? Microwaves. God bless it. That's terrible. The joke's terrible, but so is the accent. <sighs> Always end on a high note, Mike. Always end on a high note. Bye.